Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, Don't Hit the Curb, Curb Configuration Drift and SaaS Apps. This webinar will cover how organizations today can adopt best practices to avoid exposing SaaS data. Today, we've put together an all-star panel of cloud security, SaaS security, and SecOps experts. They'll cover the most common vulnerabilities with SaaS apps, keys to avoiding misconfigurations, and why your organization needs more than just configuration management to be successful. You'll also hear SaaS security trends and predictions from our guest, Forrester. You'll be hearing from Andras Chair, who is the Vice President, Principal Analyst at Forrester, Max Feldman, who is the Director of Security Engineering at AppOmni, and Drew Gatchel, who is the Director of Detection Engineering at AppOmni. We appreciate their perspective in advance. We'll then wrap up the conversation with a Q&A with our experts. First, a little bit of background of our speakers. Andras is the Vice President, Principal Analyst at Forrester, serving security and risk professionals. He is a leading expert in many areas of information security. In the cloud security domain, Andras currently covers cloud workload security, software as a service security posture management, and cloud access security brokers, infrastructure as a platform native security. He maintains an interest in evaluating the skill sets and core competencies of professional service providers in these spaces. Max is the Director of Security Engineering at AppOmni. Max has a breadth of experience in the security industry and is especially interested in web application and SaaS security. Before AppOmni, he was a member of the product security team at Slack and Salesforce. Drew is the Director of Detection Engineering at Bami, leading the effort to build detection capabilities for SaaS platforms. Before, before at Bami, he was a member of the Incident Response Team at Yahoo and Salesforce. Without further ado, Andras will kick off our conversation today. Thank you, Andrea. This is Andras. Absolutely a, a, a very timely topic to talk about SSBM or software as a service security posture management, right? So we ran a survey uh, la uh, last year, right? That, that's just a mini survey. So the vertical axis is just a number of respondents. So it's not a full blown type of quant survey, but it, it, trend wise right, and anecdotally, we asked the questions, what were the folks main drivers to uh, secure hybrid clouds, right? And regulatory uh, and compliance requirements absolutely top this game, right? So we have a lot of organizations who are falling under HIPAA, GLBA, SOX, uh, FERCNRC, and, and various four or five letter acronyms, right? That, that really drive their investment. So I think it's safe to say you cannot really go to the cloud if you don't meet these requirements and meeting these requirements actually makes a ton of sense, right? Uh, cost savings, so lowering the cost of cloud security compared to on-prem or the proportion of cloud security uh, compared to on-prem is definitely an important aspect here. Uh, data protection and, and breach prevention are always kind of coming on top. Most of, of the technical issues usually revolve around how to make sure that our data is safe. We don't uh, expose our uh, intellectual property or sensitive data, including uh, personally identifiable information, uh, personal healthcare information, and other types of assets uh, to, to basically on the internet, right? Or to bad guys. Uh, risk profiling workloads, so understanding the risk profile of what you're actually running, your, your, what, your workloads that actually house this data in the cloud is definitely important. And um, we're looking at uh, uh, platform and, and tooling changes, right? So all these configurations, all these tools in which uh, the, the, the data actually lives are in a, in a consistent flux, right? So there's just more and more uh, capabilities coming up, more and more security features that you have to be aware of and uh, really uh, kind of keeping up with all this is, is really difficult. So if we go to the next slide, um, we're gonna see um, that uh, there's definitely in cloud data protection, encrypting data at rest is, is a key requirement. Right. Um, most organizations who fall under some kind of a private uh, or some kind of a data protection regulation, typically PCI DSS or others, 
would be their regulators and auditors are typically satisfied if the data at rest is encrypted. Uh, data classification, understanding what kind of data needs to be protected, discovering that data is definitely important. Most of the time you cannot cover everything. Um, then understanding and limiting uh, data access, right? So setting privileges for users, admin users, and business users across all kinds of apps, including cloud applications, such that it's least privileged and users only have access to those data elements, those buckets, those uh, 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 storage areas in the application that they have to uh, be able to access. Data loss prevention or data leak uh, uh, protection is definitely an area being able to understand and, and what kind of data is moving into a uh, cloud application is definitely important. And again, data activity uh, monitoring and audit. So if you're seeing somebody downloading uh, basically vast amounts of data compared to what they typically download, uh, that, that's typically a, a sign of a suspicious activity that can be a risky as well. Next slide, please. So some of the uh, issues or cloud security problems that we see is obviously shadow IT. Um, you know, if you don't understand where your data goes, then you cannot protect it. Really, that's the that's the whole idea here. Uh, sanctioned application data storage, right, is, is definitely an important thing. These are the kinds of uh, OneDrive's uh, cloud, you know, any kind of uh, Google Drive, uh, SharePoint, and other types of, of platforms where you have data sitting. And, and these are sanctioned, but a lot of times you have no idea what's in there and how it is being shared, how what the, what the protection uh, on, on these data uh, uh, buckets look, uh, looks like, or how these are shared or unshared or how, how this is governed. Misconfiguration is definitely a huge problem, right? This is uh, obviously partially thanks to the uh, SaaS service providers as well as infrastructure service providers that really in their quest to provide a really usable service that's easy for an admin to configure, kind of cut corners in, in around uh, uh, mandating strong security features and to the, to the degree that you can you know, create uh, um, uh, encrypted and wide open S3 uh, buckets in, in cloud drives or in a uh, Salesforce application have our, set up that really any admin or any business user can have uh, critical uh, policy uh, access and policy change access. Unknown effective access is, uh, for SaaS users and, and infrastructure service admins. This is something that um, is really difficult because there's a lot of platforms that really make it super hard to fully understand, you know, here's the person, here's an admin user or a business user, here's a data, uh, a data resource, right? How exactly are these two points on a graph that are being mapped, right? So there's there's a graph uh, relationship, there's an there's an access relationship uh, that A can can change very quickly and B is not readily uh, discernible, right? You have to kind of analyze various types of policies. In, in various parts of an app, a cloud application to fully map out and understand the who has access to what or the what X has access to what. This is obviously gonna apply not only to carbon life forms by human beings, human admins and business users, but also to application identities and API calls. Uh, data classification, DLP, again, this is a super problematic area. Um, most of the, uh, regular expression, filter-based matching and DLP and data discovery and classification algorithms are good and they're a great starting point, but a lot of times you have to do a lot more contextual digging and access analysis to fully understand that, hey, this is an, an, an invoice, right? And even though it, it may not have a credit card number on it, um, it actually represents sensitive information and, and has to be treated as such. Encryption and key management integration. A lot of times, you know, cloud applications have a, a spotty record and, and, and uh, track record of, of how data is encrypted and how the keys are actually managed 
uh, in them and how they can tie to something like Fortinix or the HP the enterprise voltage kinds of, kinds of key management tool or the AWS KMS or Azure Key Vault and other types of key management solutions. And then the integration with on-premises security tools and processes is typically also relatively problematic. Um, a lot of times our companies just have not changed their tooling uh, to uh, cloud-based security tools that cover cloud apps. Sometimes they're trying to use uh, on-prem CMDB tools or on-prem the same security incident and event management, security analytics kinds of tools to have a good understanding of, of uh, what's going on. Next slide. So I think it's also safe to say that um, if you look at SaaS security, right? There is definitely the SSPM part, software as a service security posture management, but there's also SaaS ops, uh, which really revolves around uh, a broader context, right? You know, understanding uh, the um, uh, cost control, usage requirements, deployment requirements, not just you know, security related artifacts like SSPM. And there's also CSGs and CASBs, right? So uh, a proxy based or API based approach uh, to how uh, you can control applications. So what, what I wanna say with this, this Venn diagram, right? There's these tools are almost going to be required in some kind of combination with each other, right, to, call, to, uh, to provide a layered set of controls to protect software service applications. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, right, um, it is uh, important to, to realize, right, that software as a service proliferation exposes these application complexities and vulnerabilities, right? Cloud first is definitely an important aspect here. Critical data is in the cloud. And as I said, there's a high level of complexity of policies and entitlements in software and service applications. This is really, you know, there's no Zacamol, there's no uh, OAuth, there's no such, uh, no real standardization of authorization management in software and service applications. So Salesforce is gonna be different from Microsoft 365, is gonna be different from ServiceNow, Workday, and all these other applications that you have out there. They're all proprietary, all these are, uh, uh, artifacts and policy designs for authorization are going to be pr proprietary to the software as a service application vendor. Um, it is because of this, it's really difficult in, um, to understand and educate and really assess risk in software as a service applications. And on top of this, there's just, a shortage of people um, and, and basically who can understand this. And there's typically a gap, you know, it may be a turf war, it may be a political kind of issue between application owners and security. So I always tell security folks that if, you're, if they're able to get at least read only access to the policies of an API of, a, of, of, of the software service applications policy API, right? then you know half of the battle is won right so that's a, that's already a a very encouraging sign um if you go with the next slide right uh it's it's uh, good to see that uh sspm tools are agentless right so they basically um do not require agents do not require downtime basically the most the the, the simplest way or the least uh, uh, kind of conflicting with operations way these, uh, these SSPM tools work is that they have a read-only account to the policy management API of, um, of a software as a service application or multiple software as a service applications, and they can query the policies, right? They can query the entire set of policies uh, and they, they, can, they can detect things like policy drift, right? So if you define a certain set of policies, say in Salesforce or Microsoft 365, and the tool, the SSPM tool, then sees a drift from, from that known good gold standard, if you will, uh, then it can, the SSPM tool can uh, notify an app owner or security or, or multiple folks within the organization, in, you know, security incident and response kinds of folks. Um, there is, in these SSPM tools, there's usually a, a, a sizable library of best practices when it comes to compliance mandates, right? So if your auditory mandates that you have to be PCI DSS compliant, 
SSPM tools typically translate this SSP, uh, this, this PCI VSS compliance to very specific artifacts and policy templates that you can then you just kind of click on and bring in. And this is basically across the board. There's also activity analytics for threat detection, right? So this is, uh, it's not only, um, you know, how the, the whole, how Salesforce or Microsoft 365 is actually configured, but there is definitely an important element here of, of how uh, the, the data is accessed in the platform, right? So SSPM tools are able to actually look at the activity and analyze it for threats, such as, as I said earlier today, uh, an, an unusually large volume of activity that, you know, usually if somebody looks at four records in Salesforce in a day, and today they're exporting like 10,000 records, right? I mean, that's definitely a sign of unusual activity. And then there's obviously anomaly detection. How come somebody is authorized to do something, they never use that capability, never look at that data, but today it's, it's full speed ahead and they're dumping out the data from, from those uh, uh, software as a service kinds of uh, application data storage pieces or parts. Um, I, I wanna point out actually uh, two key capabilities or key requirement areas, right? In these SSPM tools. On the next slide, so if we go to the next slide, identity is definitely key, right? So uh, for admin users, right, you have to set up password policies uh, that, are, that make sure that your, your passwords are relatively strong and have length requirements, you know, uh, composition requirements, et cetera. Multi-factor authentication is, is definitely an important area. I think today's, in today's environment, uh, passwords are just not going to cut it. It's just the passwords are really uh, a type of authentication method mechanism that needs to be enhanced and, and augmented with a second factor, like a you know, one-time password sent to a mobile phone, uh, SMS inbox or email or push-based notification to a mobile app or password generation on a hardware token, something, right? Uh, and session timeouts are maintained, right? So you have to have a, an overall stance and the policy on these uh, items. Uh, least liable privileges for admins, which is really zero trust enforcement, right? So if, if you have somebody who, let's just say a, uh, a data scientist, right? They don't need to have access to manage the role-based access control uh, of, a, of a SaaS application or, or completely be able to redo the policies, right? So there's certain level of privileges that are needed for, for somebody, an admin user, or even a business user to do their jobs. But there's a lot of times excessive privileges that exist that basically give the user a lot more control and power uh, over the whole software service application, which is really dangerous, right? Because if that user account gets taken over or hacked or hijacked, the attackers will use it to, to do all sorts of bad things like, you know, uh, create new buckets, create new instances, create new uh, service areas, steal data, et cetera, right? So the more you're able to uh, adhere to zero trust or least privileges uh, for admin users, the, the better, the, the lower the chance of, of a data breach. Uh, least privileges for business users is also important, right? So uh if if you have say an accounts receivable clerk they shouldn't have access to the accounts payable part of a financial of a of a financial application or accounting application um if you are an hr right an hr uh practitioner you shouldn't be able to submit a salary increase and approve it for your, you know by yourself right i mean these are just kinds of things that really are trivial, but a lot of times you have these types of separation to do these violations. And a lot of times you also want to be able to do uh, access rights recertification review of business users uh, rights. What this boils down to is that every three months, six months or a year, uh, the manager or the application owner gets all the entitlements of all, the, all their business users and they can then make uh, a decision whether the user should actually maintain and, and, and keep their entitlements or they should be able to kind of uh, relinquish them and that these entitlements should be taken away from them because they should be able to do their jobs um, 
without those high level or excessive privileges. Again, this is a periodic review because people tend to uh, uh, basically collect entitlements throughout uh, their tenure in, in one position and, and, and also when they're moving across position, this, this, this entitlement collection is even more pronounced. If we go to uh, the next slide, I wanna talk a bit about data protection. Um, Data protection is definitely a, uh, an important aspect here. As I said, discovering data and classifying data and responding to those concerns that I showed at the, at the beginning of my presentation, checking for misconfigured and data, misconfiguration data storage and overshare storage, right? So if you have your, say, uh, corporate acquisition plan uh, in an Excel spreadsheet on OneDrive, right? It is generally not a good idea to share it with the whole world. And it's even, even for read-only access, it's even a worse idea uh, to actually share it with a read-write access to the whole world, right? And a lot of times people don't actually realize this. These are very simple kinds of things, but ma maintaining control over this in a large volume of data over in a large organization can be absolutely problematic. Uh, encryption and up to date on, on SSL, TLS, this is an application specific thing, but given the fact that many uh, 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 lower version TLS implementations may be vulnerable to attacks, you definitely wanna have an understanding as to what degree uh, the encryption for managing data in transit data protection is, is up to snuff. Mapping access rights between resources. This is what I was also alluding to. Uh, understanding the, the graph of access is definitely uh, a very important requirement. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, before handing it over to Max, I just wanted to kind of talk a bit about best practices, right? Uh, so introducing these software as a service security posture management protection layers gradually is a key consideration and, and, and requirement, right? So you wanna look at configuration management in terms of baselining, accessible approaches, drift detection, the identity access uh, and access management for business and admin users, and, and fully understand the joiner, mover and lever life cycle for all these business and admin access. And if there is a problem, obviously there's, there should be some kind of remediation capabilities, right? Um, even if the remediation is just sending an email to an application owner or opening a Jira ticket, right? Hey, this file is being overshared, uh, Mr. SharePoint administrator, do something along this. Or, or this uh, Google Drive uh, data is, is totally unencrypted, Miss uh, Google Drive administrator, do something about it. These are the kinds of, of elements, right, that, that you really want to want to be able to do, uh, if not just fixing the policy artifacts themselves from, from an SSPM tool itself. Uh, and again, data centricity, identities, access to data, I cannot really uh, emphasize this enough. Uh, the mapping and the configuration and access monitoring in all uh, layers is, is very important. What I want to kind of underline here uh, is, this is impossible to do, um, SSPM is impossible to do on a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet or an electronic forms document because you have a consist consistent set of change, change rate in the environment. And, and to reconciling with uh, basically the, how your policies are set with how, how the data is being accessed, how these applications are being accessed, and finding uh, anomalies or risky activities is really not like it's not on a human scale. You can you can basically look at these log files uh, all day long, and you may not be able to kind of find problems there uh, if you're just trying to kind of manually do these things. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Max. Thank you. Yeah. So hey, I'm Max Feldman um, at uh app on me and uh used to work at slack and salesforce before that on the product security teams and now i'm the director of security engineering here so um yeah thanks andrash for covering the whole space um we're gonna get into a bit more specifics of of SaaS security and sspm as far as implementation is concerned here so um 
as more SaaS platforms have been adopted into the enterprise, SaaS ecosystems have grown more and more complex. So that means maintaining appropriate SaaS security is becoming more challenging. Even inventory is becoming more challenging, let alone securing it. So a robust SaaS security program covers a business's entire SaaS footprint and provides security teams with greater visibility into threats. So many organizations don't extend their SaaS security program beyond configuration and posture man uh, beyond configuration management, but that puts SaaS data at risk. Um, so configuration and posture management are essential. Uh, they're necessary, but they're not sufficient for securing your entire organization. They're just some of the many capabilities that are necessary for a comprehensive security program. So with um, configuration and posture management, you want custom configuration checks, you want policy scanning, data access management, data leakage prevention, compliance policies, and all of those are still just a piece of the, the larger puzzle of securing your organization. So next slide, please. So you can't stop there. Um, you, many companies, as I said, don't go deeper than just that configuration management. And that's a great start, but it's not sufficient. So um, when it comes to SaaS security, you need to be thinking about all of the business critical applications and the sensitive data that's at risk there. Um, every SaaS app can have interconnectedness with multiple others than apps that aren't even in your inventory. So a successful SaaS security program requires several additional components. Uh, next slide, please. And the first of those components uh, is third-party application management. So gaining visibility into these third-party applications that are connected to your SaaS environment should be a top priority. And you can have third-party apps that are connected to multiple SaaS applications. So you have 10 SaaS apps and each of them have 10 applications connected to them. Um, you, you get multiples of who can access your sensitive data. So, App Omni, for example, enables you to get an inventory of uh, connected apps and users and access and see which users are actually utilizing them and understanding the level of data each app has. Um, and some of our internal research shows that third party risk is more prevalent than many CISOs and security practitioners actually realize. Um, so on average, we've seen businesses have 42 connected apps over half of the apps haven't actually been used in over six months, but still retain their access to SaaS data. And nearly half were installed by end users and not actually security or, or IT teams. Um, a lot of SaaS applications, their ease of use and their value is through these connections, but sometimes that opens it up to individual users saying, hey, I want this nifty app for productivity, and now it has access to all of your company's data. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it off to Drew to talk about some of the other steps that are necessary for securing your SaaS environment. Thanks, Matt. Well, yeah, as I said earlier, my name is Drew Gadgel. I am the Director of Detection Engineering here at App Omni. Um, prior to App Omni, I was at Yahoo and Salesforce on their incident response teams. Um, and SaaS platforms are complex and dynamic by nature, uh, which means periodic audits and pen tests themselves are just insufficient for figuring out what's going on with your SaaS app, right? And maintaining the security of your SaaS platform. Um, so it's better to protect your SaaS data by embracing the automation provided by App Omni, uh, which continuously monitors your policy settings, your permissions, and delivers alerts when changes are made. Um, additionally, uh, also ensuring that all the audit logs from all these different SaaS platforms are collected, normalized, and enriched to provide uh, additional context and data uh, on events of interest to you as a security team. And those are integrated into your existing security stack, like your SIM platforms and case management. Um, next slide, please. Right, and the, the big piece is, right, security teams are all, already kind of often inundated with requests and stretched in on the, the existing security case workload that they have outside of SaaS apps, right? Uh, and SaaS apps, because they're complex, right, might not, those teams might not have a structured process to identify, detect, protect against, 
respond to or recover from security threats uh, happening on SaaS platforms. Um, so this is where like automated workflows really come play and come handy, uh, right? Because it allows a team to establish and enforce consistent data access policies across all their SaaS applications. And it helps elevate or alleviate, excuse me, some of the burden on your security team and helps them stay vigilant about what possible areas of exposure that they have um, across, you know, your role-based access control, establishing these privilege, um, generating alerts and kind of establishing that funnel of fidelity. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, additionally, uh, a SSPM helps you shift left in your development cycle, right? And maintain enterprise level quality by leveraging DevSecOps uh, for your SaaS platforms, especially with practices built by App Omni, right? Our platform delivers automation and continuous monitoring assistant communication between the teams. Um, and it helps ensure that your teams respond to threats of fit, uh, efficiently and at scale as SaaS platform or SaaS application adoption continues to grow, right? It allows you to integrate with your sample providers, or your SSL providers, uh, provide data classification, allow you to establish custom policies. You know, we have always on incident response, uh, establishing authentication flows for the for your SSL. Um, next slide. And uh, <clears throat> help you with governance and risk compliance, right? Um, with uh, FRM, you can achieve and maintain compliance with regulatory requirements over time uh, and help your SaaS security program that, that is aligned to your business objectives, right? With our with our compliance policies and frameworks, um, you can use due diligence to establish a SaaS governance or assurance plan uh, that implements security measures to reduce the risk associated with your SaaS applications, right? Um, you can have a compliance dashboard, which provides real-time visibility into the level of compliance and non-compliance in your SaaS applications and your associated policies. Right, this helps you establish, you know, across, you know, all those governance and requirements frameworks, the SOC two, your NIST, uh, your SOCs, so on and so forth. Uh, and now I'm gonna hand it back to Andras uh, to wrap us up. Yeah, definitely. Next slide, please. So, in in terms of of uh, some some best practices, right, and and preparatory steps, right. Um, securing the data and not just perimeter again is, is important. Uh, understanding that who has access to your data is, is critical here, right? You cannot really control data and its access and its path uh, unless you really have a full visibility and the full picture as to who is has access to the data and who has access to the policies that drive access to the data. I think that's also important. Implementing guardrails for users is, is definitely an important uh, uh, question here. If we go to the next slide. Uh, so the market is definitely uh, showing signs of, 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 of really healthy activity. It's still a nascent space, right? We're seeing a lot of interest in here. Definitely not a standardized set of features across vendors, but there's definitely that the whole uptake of, of um, application uh, breadth and depth right so basically broadening the application catalog for managed applications in microsoft 365 and salesforce right um, we're seeing a lot more advanced a lot a lot more advanced artificial intelligence and machine learning ai and ml algorithms right to understand what constitutes normalcy in policies or or access to data uh, a lot more triggering of events um, a lot better sorting, searching, filtering, and triggering operations and encrypted data, um, DLP kinds of improvements, so a lot less user friction. Uh, one thing I, I didn't kind of uh, uh, end up talking about in my uh, previous kind of section here is that if you cause any kind of user friction for either your internal employee workforce users or business partners or even uh, customers, consumers, right, most importantly, there's going to be a lot of problems and a lot of phones ringing here, right? So there's just going to be a really, um, a really well thought through uh, uh, kind of process around this, which is which does not really have an, uh, any kind of noticeable impact on a customer or user experience. Uh, SOC uh, operation, security operations center integration. So this is not in the standalone type of thing. This is there's there's a lot of other aspects in security operations center uh, centers that really need to 
uh, kind of cover uh, uh, software as a service uh, application uh, posture management. An application API integration platforms, um, if you have if you have a, an, an API gateway or XML gateway, it's definitely a good idea to actually look at those apps that have a, a programmatic API level access to your um, cloud apps and really understand what these uh, apps do as well. Next slide. Uh, so if, if we look at uh, some predictions, right? We are seeing definitely convergence between the software as a service security posture management, cloud security gateways or CASBs uh, as they're otherwise referred to, and secure web gateways or SWIGs, right? So these are definitely the target that we want to manage and secure is software as a service applications. Uh, we also see some conversions between CSPM and SSPM, which is really cloud security posture management for infrastructure as a service platforms, that's CSPM, and posture management, configuration management for software as a service types of applications, the things that we cover today. There's more uh, support for cloud applications. There's more understanding of access pattern, access patterns, right? What an upload, a download looks like, what a shared activity looks like, how you need to interpret it. There is a lot more, uh, we're seeing a lot more investment, at least on the vendor's part in, as I said, artificial intelligence and machine learning in detecting the unusual configuration artifacts and access patterns. The depth of API call support into these environments is just astoundingly broadening, right? And some kind of integration with a legacy on-prem DLP solution or a cloud DLP solution is, is, is absolutely inevitable in our opinion, right? So these are uh, some of the predictions here that we see. So I think I want to hand it back to Andrea at this point to have some uh, question and answer here. Thank you so much, Andrash, and thank you, um, Max, Drew Andrash, for sharing your insights and expertise with us. We're going to take the next 15 minutes or so and do a live Q&A with our presenters. So I'd like to start with Andrash. Can you um, share with us how you think SSPM, so SaaS Security Posture Management, compares with CSPM? cloud security posture management. What are the comparisons? What are the differences? Sure, sure. So in a lot of ways, they're similar, obviously not identical, but obviously different. So they're, they both revolve around managing configuration artifacts, setting a baseline, understanding deltas, understanding drifts, drifts or, or remediating or preventing drifts. There is also the aspect of policy best practices for you know, various kinds of, of regulatory requirements or best practices. It's just the targets that are different, right? You know, CSPM typically covers the base configuration of AWS, Azure, GCP, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, et cetera, whilst SSPM typically covers uh, software service kinds of business applications, such as, you know, Microsoft 365, Salesforce, ServiceNow, and others. Great, thank you. Um, the next question um, that came in is from Max. What are some of the most common misconfigurations you see organizations challenged by? Yeah, um, so there are a lot, but at a high level, I would say um, third party access is probably the most common issue in terms of both visibility and uh restrictions on that so a bit more specifically things like third-party applications but also external users and guest access to various SaaS environments um, a lot of times it's not necessarily easy to see who or what has access um, if it's apps what kind of scopes do they have if it's guest users what makes them a guest uh, what are their policies around auth what roles do those guests have um, so that inventory alone can be difficult and um, we also see a lot of lack of restriction on that so in the for the sake of easy collaboration or easy uh, productivity app installation might just be open and guest invitation might just be open so people can install what they want and invite who they want and that's handy if you need to work quickly, but it leaves um, the environment in a state where there might be 
uncontrolled users or applications with large uh, unrestricted access to all of the data in the environment. So that's something we see pretty commonly. I'd also say um, for specific configurations, sometimes we see MFA or auth policies not set up to standards um, that an organization actually wants or, or a misunderstanding of how they're configured, um, the assumption that things are, are locked down when they're not actually as locked down as one would think. Great answer, thank you so much. Um, next question, this would be potentially for Max Andrew. I have a CASB solution in place. Why do I need additional tools? Yeah, so, um, CASBs can be a little bit, um, so config, configurations in SAS environments can be opaque to CASBs because of the nature of how they're connected and what data they're seeing. So they're sitting at the edge, they're watching traffic, but they don't necessarily have the same visibility into um, how these orgs and these environments are configured. So if you're if you're an admin, you can go and see how settings are configured. And if you are connecting via APIs, you can pull some of this data and automate that. But a CASB just has a more limited view of the world. And they can also be a little bit reactive. So instead of saying, oh, this setting is misconfigured, change this to prevent an issue, a CASB might see um, evidence of a breach or evidence of something bad happening after the misconfiguration. So um, there are certain gaps in CASBs that um, you wouldn't necessarily have if you're connecting directly to the SaaS application or you're um, working with the APIs or you're, you're doing kind of a continuous monitoring of those settings. Um, Drew, is there more you would add to that? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the other thing worth noting on CASBs is um, their scope of visibility. Um, you know, it's great that individual users are logging in or working through a CASB, um, but typically your third-party apps aren't. Uh, so CASBs have effectively almost no visibility there depending on the deployment model. Um, the other thing is it's worth considering um, depending on the deployment model of a CASB uh, and the, the SaaS platform that it's integrating with, um, that SaaS platform might have native threat detection capabilities that you might effectively be neutralizing because you're working through a CASB um, because all the activity looks like it's coming from a CASB versus you know kind of some of the anomaly-based logic that some of these SaaS platforms might integrate natively. Um, never mind, you know, third-party solutions trying to do threat detection or whatever else on a uh, on a SaaS platform. So, you know, I think there's there's certainly some drawbacks with using a CASB um, there, so, which is why you would need some additional tooling. Great, thank you. This next question is also for Max and Drew. What are the consequences of not having some of the capabilities that you mentioned in place. I'm, I'm sure a lot of organizations can say that they run a man, monthly scan and that may um, seem like, like enough, but what are really the consequences of not having these solutions in place? Yeah, so it can vary, but the consequences can be pretty severe. So uh, in a, ignoring SaaS, like let's say you're you're looking at infrastructure security or you're securing endpoints, you're not doing a monthly antivirus scan. You're not doing a monthly scan of your infrastructure because things can be exploited in a second, in a moment. And there's more and more attention being paid to SaaS vulnerabilities and SaaS misconfigurations. So uh, I'd say the, the days where you could maybe have configuration drift and fix it in a week or two or, or realize a month later and not have it exploited are, are gone as there's more and more tooling and automation for attacking and pen testing. So if, um, if you check something one day, a week later, someone installs a new app. That app has a bunch of scopes that you don't necessarily want. That app could be breached a week later and you still are within this window where you haven't actually identified a misconfiguration. So continuous monitoring um, for SaaS and, and just security in general is super important. It's um, it, attackers don't wait 
a month or or whatever timeline it's there are tools that are constantly poking and prodding um, and looking to exfiltrate data or looking to take advantage of misconfigurations in in all areas of security and so SAS shares that with these other areas in that continuous monitoring is essential and having complete visibility and uh, complete management of these configurations is, is also essential because if you're 90% of the way there on what you're covering, that 10% could still be exploited. And that's that's kind of just like high level, just talking about configurations and those issues that can happen there. I think um, Drew maybe has more to add and uh, a monthly scan doesn't even touch on the, the um, events or, or threat detection, et cetera. So. Yeah, I think you nailed it on the head, right? Nobody, nobody thinks about doing A/B scans or vulnerability scans on a monthly cycle, right? They're they're hourly, daily, um, weekly at worst, right? It's, I mean, as you as you pointed out, threat actors are becoming more mature around targeting and operationalizing against SaaS platforms. Uh, SaaS is effectively kind of becoming like the new endpoint, right? I mean, most most people are starting to work through SaaS and not. But native applications. So, I mean, nobody nobody would do threat detection on a monthly cycle, right? Like you're not going to collect your event logs, your audit logs from a from an endpoint or from a server, from infrastructure on a monthly cycle. You're collecting them in as real time as you possibly can, so you can detect things as soon as you can and kind of lower that dwell time. Uh, SaaS applications are no different, right? Threat actors are actively operating against them. And you want to detect those as soon as you reasonably can, right? Whether it's a misconfiguration that would open a hole or figuring out that somebody exploited um, a vulnerability or a misconfiguration that you had in introduced. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, that's that's kind of the consequence, right? If you're if you're just relying on this this long cycle or this long dwell time of um, assessing your SaaS applications, you're kind of opening yourself up there. Yeah, I think we're, we're kind of seeing SaaS as the operating system of the workplace more and more. And so um, there are analogs for how you secure operating systems and endpoints, like Drew said, and those same practices need to be applied to these SaaS environments as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, for this last question, it's for Andras. What do you think it will take to make SaaS security solutions a more mainstream component of the security stack? I think uh, it, it's coverage, right? Uh, in terms of applications, uh, both breadth, breadth and depth, right? Uh, and obviously understanding the fine grain, you know, kind of nuances in, in these apps, the applications. So, yeah. so that's one. The other thing I would say is just effective detection of issues and, and anomalous activity. And three, uh, really a good understanding of, of, the, of the ecosystem of these applications, right? Um, most of these cloud applications are not used in, in a silo, right? They're connected, interconnected, and the data is actually moving between them, right? So, um, you know, I think the whole understanding that these software service applications uh, really maintain the repository, maintain the operating system and, and the repository of, of sensitive data, I think that kind of recognition, I think, is, is very important here in, in, in operating these. Great. Thank you for attending our webinar today and special thank you to our presenters for sharing their expertise and insights with us. Um, App Omni is a SaaS security management solution that gives businesses the tools they need to protect data across all of their SaaS applications. It provides in-depth coverage across all SaaS apps, unprecedented vis visibility, actionable insights, and increased automation to secure the data housed in SaaS applications and keep it secure over time. Feel free to share this webinar recording with your colleagues and please enjoy the rest of your day and be well.